little older, but you've got time. And I think this is the kind of thing that we should start thinking about. Stop wasting this human potential. And getting back to your problem, uh, one of the things that's wrong with most of our programs is that we do things for people. The thing that irritates me most about the consumer movement is that nobody asks us, oh, see the pretty gadget we're making for you. Now you damn well better buy it because I made it for you. Well, nobody asked me, did I need it, did I want it, and am I right-handed or left-handed? And it's as basic as that. And so all through our society, the youth, the minority groups, the women, we don't want to be told, we want to be asked. And if we start asking the seniors, we would stop building them studio apartments with no bedrooms. We would stop forcing them into high-rise towers where they're terrified if the apartment, if the elevator goes out, as it does because they don't like to climb stairs. They shouldn't have to. We might make gardens available to them, which is something that most seniors are also very fond of. You know, little things like this, but it does make life worth living if we'd only ask them. And, and you know, you can just extend that to anything. Yes? Given the flattening out of the uh, birth rate and uh, the longevity mm -hmm. that we're acquiring, But not as well as in other countries, don't forget that. <laughs> Move to Sweden. <laughs> I wonder if there's an analog in our whole society for the situation in the UAW. You mean in the sense that we should all organize? Yes. No, not, not yeah. so much that as yeah. in the sense of we're going to have a disproportionate oh, yes. in terms of our presence. Yeah. Uh, and that frightens some people. But what will happen is that uh, when seniors become the majority, that will be the ruling class, and the rest of society will have to contend with that. Now, if you're in your 50s, as I am, that's not frightening. If you're very young, <laughs> it might be. <laughs> uh, I simply see uh, that the majority of so society will then be run for the majority. Now, that's going to be a little hard on the producing members of society, but, but they will have the control of being in control of the production end. They will have to be catered to. They will become an elite class. I don't think it's going to level out quite that much. For one thing, I think we're going to get away from mandatory retirement. I think if we ever reach that stage, if we're not all carried off by premature heart attacks, which is a nice balancing factor, uh, if we all reach that stage, uh, then the mandatory retirement will no longer become necessary it will then be a matter of free choice. I know people who are sick of their jobs at 50 and who should be retired. They're a drag on the rest of the organization. I know plenty of people who are still productive. I see people on the faculty laughing. Everybody knows what. Uh, <laughs> I think there are people uh, who sh there should, people should be jailed for even suggesting that some people retire. You know, can you imagine some of our great symphony conductors? Almost every one of them is well past retirement age. Can you imagine losing all that talent, you know, all that creative artistry, all that fire and energy of an Arthur Rubinstein, for example, if you made him stop playing because he's over 65? So I think that we're going to recognize virtuosity as having no relationship to age. And we will, by virtue of necessity, be forced to continue letting those seniors who choose continue to be productive. And I think that will be one answer to the imbalance, to the inverted pyramid. You know, someone's still got to tote that barge, and if a younger person doesn't do it, an older person will, and will probably want to. It definitely will. can't because some daughterer wants to retain his or her job. And so they, they really have to cajole and wheedle and, and kind of anesthetize somebody into retiring. And then they turn around and take an extra job. 
all these legends about women sweeping the streets, they're little old ladies who, are who want to keep on sweeping. They're mostly older people who want to supplement their pensions and want to keep busy. Uh, they're museum guards. They're cloakroom attendants. They bring you hot tea, which is a lifeline when you come in off the street into a museum or a theater. They're very busy. Uh, they act as volunteers in the hospitals. They're, they're doing all kinds of things. Retirement, if you retire, is voluntary and is another step in activity. Now, I'm not going to recommend that we all move to Moscow, but I think we should look at their attitudes toward their elderly as one way in which they are used creatively. I doubt that we could ape the Russian way of life, but I think we have something to learn from their attitude. There's respect for the aged. And it's because they are still considered productive, functioning members of society with a place in society. And this is something I'd like to see us carry over here. Because one of the features there that I admired very much, that and the ballet were great. <laughs> you commented about the cost of medication and uh, some of the work that's been done in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the, well, the, the relationship with the doctor, which is a very difficult uh, situation and this mm -hmm. contributes to loneliness, to poor health. Yeah. This sort of well, that's another speech, because I, <laughs> I have a whole speech that I've been giving to hospital administrators uh, about uh, the, the use of the consumer, the attitude toward the consumer in medicine. My theory, which is, I find is echoed by a lot of people in hospital administration, is that the sole function of a medical administration is to act as a protection between the doctor and the patient. And if you stop and think of the way a hospital is organized, the way a medical care, our medical care is organized, it is to shield the doctor from the patient, who's kind of pushed through on an assembly line. You know, that was a satire I saw while I was in Russia, by the way, where they do have their problems with mass medicine. Uh, seven men line up, you know, back to, you know, in a, in a row like this, you know, chest to back, and the doctor puts a, st a stethoscope to the chest of one, you know, <laughs> even, without, even with the language barrier, you know, the thing came through loud and clear. And that's what we're doing now. Uh, so that we, re have, we have to do something about the depersonalization of the individual, in particular the senior in the clinic. Uh, and the problem there is we, we don't have enough doctors to go around. Uh, that's why I think that we have to take a look at medical practice, and this is being done in many ways, the paraprofessional, the trained medical aide, the nurse who really is, you know, kind of caught in limbo between the, uh, the nurse's aide and the doctor, who can carry on very many medical functions. And we have to expand the base of our professional care so that more of it is available to more people and you don't break away from the personal uh, contact. Is that what you meant? Yes. Or did you mean in terms of cost? Well, yeah what you're saying, but I want to know also, uh, what sort of cooperation uh, are you getting, or objections are you getting then, from uh, the medical profession and the others concerned? Well, it's very hard to talk to the medical profession. There are people in the fields of public health who are very concerned about this kind of thing, and they're being, uh, beginning to talk. Um, hospitals are being rebuilt now to conform more to community needs. Uh, our hospitals, like some of our universities, present company accepted, are overbuilt in terms of beds. It's a status thing to get more beds, so that we now have beds empty in some areas and totally inadequate care in others. So that we're beginning to put three or four hospitals together. We have a center where there are about four hospitals in a row that we're competing. Now we're beginning to combine facilities. We don't need... Um, the premature birth facilities in highly expensive specialized ones in every single one of those hospitals. You can move a preemie down the block from one to the center in the other. You don't need very expensive uh, therapy in all hospitals. You don't need a very expensive cobalt radiation lab in all the hospitals. So that is one way of coordinating. Of course, what happens then is that you're beginning to build a monster, you know, a great big factory. I don't know any way out of that except to hope that we can do a, a redesigning of the thinking of the people in these medical factories to not make them lose the personal touch. And as I said, that's a whole other speech that I'd rather not get into now. It's a very big subject. I always start by telling about my gallbladder operation, a great example of depersonalization. <laughs>
<laughs> I was known as narrow ducts. Nobody knew my name, but I had narrow ducts. Everybody in the hospital knew my ducts. Everybody came. They would walk in. They would walk in, and I'd be do dozing. And some would very modestly, you know, pull down the bedspread, pull up my hospital gown, and look at all those tubes and say, narrow ducts. And they'll <laughs> cover me up again and walk out again. You don't exist. <laughs> Part of my problem. I got the narrowest ducts in town. <laughs> That's the last time I get my gallbladder taken in, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, you've all been very patient, and thank you. The spear knows where to reach me. If anyone has questions they haven't thought of, do write me. <laughs>